we have a bond that is extremely unique. We both know that. So it's an unfortunate bond, but it's a fortunate outcome. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am not Anna Jaworski. I am Anna's husband, Frank, and I'm the guest host for Heart Dad Sundays in February of 2023. Anna and I have an adult child with a single ventricle heart. That's why I'm the guest host of the program. Today's show is Carl Wolford, heart warrior, dad, and grandfather. Carl was born with total anomalous pulmonary venous return, or TAPVR, and had surgery by Dr. Denton Cooley at four months of age in January 1958 at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas. Carl was Dr. Cooley's second successful case of this heart defect. And the first one is now Carl's friend. Carl participated in a lifetime of sports. Baseball, tennis, golf, anything with a ball, and Carl was there. He even tried snow skiing, during which time he became aware of a problem with high altitudes and thin air when a person has a congenital heart condition. Carl's biggest passion is pool. He tours mostly the southern United States in tournaments. One of his goals was to win a national championship, which happened three years ago in Las Vegas. His new goal is to add a state title or two to his resume. Carl has three children and five grandchildren. None have any signs of heart issues of any kind. Carl has done great ever since he had his surgery with Dr. Cooley until he entered his 50s. He's now 65 years young, and his motto is, Life is short, play hard. Loyal Heart to Heart with Anna listeners will remember Carl from his appearance on the show entitled, You Are Not Alone. This was the very first Heart to Heart with Anna episode. Welcome back to Heart to Heart with Anna, Carl Wolford. Thanks, Frank, for having me. It's good to be here again. And in fact, it's good to be anywhere right now. I appreciate what y'all do for the heart community, you and Anna. We all appreciate it, I'm sure. Well, Carl, it's nice to chat with you. It's been a while since we've talked to each other. Carl and I had a chance to meet at one of the Children's Heart Foundation events in Austin, Texas, years ago. Let's start by having you explain to our listeners, Carl, about what TAPVR is and what Dr. Cooley did in the operation that you had. Basically, the TAPVR, during development, developing as a baby, the vessels between the heart and the lungs are attached, basically in the wrong place. And the surgeon puts them where they belong. So what was happening with me was that oxygenated blood was not getting to the body nearly enough. And it took a while for that to show up as what it was as TAPVR. We didn't even know it at first, 1957, late 1957, 1958. We had no idea. All my parents knew was that I cried a lot. I didn't keep food down at all and could not sleep and pretty much, <laughs> pretty much a train wreck from the beginning. So that oxygenated blood wouldn't get to the body. And eventually, in my case, right before four months, we had surgery four months, but leading up to that, it became an issue of my parents knowing that something was wrong and they were not getting the answers that they wanted from the pediatricians, the doctors that they brought to, because I was number four to them, the fourth child. And so they've been there before. So... Uh, They knew that something was wrong, so we moved on and and eventually wound up with a doctor who was a stand-in for an existing cardiologist. And lo and behold, that doctor told mom and dad, this baby has a heart issue. I'm going to schedule an appointment for y'all to bring him to Texas Children's, and I want you to see a doctor named Denton Cooley. And they did. And he said, y'all don't wait around, get this baby to Houston pretty quick. And they did. That's where it all started with Dr. Cooley. Wow. Now I know from listening to the first episode you were on with Anna, that you started to develop some arrhythmias when you were in your fifties, long after your first surgery. Can you tell us what symptoms you had and what your doctors decided to do about it? I went from several years of checkups as a baby and a toddler to 50 with no association, no visit, no anything to any cardiologist at all. Obviously did a very good job. There was no need for anything else to be done, but eventually the symptoms started to show up 
and live in a life of sports, the shortness of breaths episodes and climbing a set of stairs, I'm thinking, and I'm winded. It didn't happen overnight. It just was a little buildup. That was probably the biggest sign that something was up. And my mom, my brothers kept on me. You mm -hmm. should go see a cardiologist. You should go see a cardiology. You haven't seen one since you're a baby. And you're 50 now. So I said, fine. Okay, whatever. I'll go and do a cardiologist. So I got an appointment. And we went back to Houston, saw a cardiologist, and he did some testing on me. He said, yeah, you've got a little blip here and there. Well, the blips were these arrhythmias and what I call little, almost nothing blip blips in the beginning. And what eventually happened was they got a little closer together. And as they got closer together, the cardiologist said, you know what? Let's do a Holter monitor for you over a weekend. I said, okay. So we did. And back in on Monday morning for that appointment, that follow-up to give him the Holter. And in my elementary mind, think, well, okay, here's your Holter monitor back. You didn't see anything. See you later. And all I was wrong. <laughs> was right way, way wrong. I walked in the office before I could even sign in. He saw me walk in the door and he motions to me, come see me, come see me, come around, come through the door, come over here. I said, me? I'm pointing to myself. He said, yeah. I said, oh boy, okay, whatever. We're not even going to go to a little office. And he's, well, let's come on back here. And he set a piece of paper down on the desk and it was a result of the Holter monitor and the Holter monitor picture on it. That was the reason why we took our next step. So do you mean it was a picture of the rhythms that they were getting or a, a count of the dysrhythmias, yeah. or that sort of thing? Okay. Now I have to ask because I'm 60 years old myself and I know how middle-aged men can be. So were you really that agreeable? Did they suggest one time and you said, sure, I'll go see a doctor. Or did you have to be convinced a little bit? No, I had no association with boy, pretty much any doctor. I've broken bones. I had a broken arm, a broken collarbone, different things that happened over the years, but nothing heart related. So yeah, I kind of, I relented. <laughs> Mom was my rock and she told me, she said, you should do this. My brothers are banging in my ear too, saying, do this, do this. And eventually I said, fine. Okay. Good for you. I know how it is. Sometimes the people that love you, they're the ones that make you take well, care that, of yourself, whether you that, like it or that's not. What, that's what I have. <laughs> so tell us about how you got a pacemaker and how it's affected your life. Well, the pacemaker came about from that day when I walked in that office and he saw me in the window and said, would you come around? I want to show you something. That was 10 years ago, last year, April of last year. He said, come around. He said, I want to show you this. And he showed me the paper. And the paper was like you said, well, the arrhythmias, the beat, the heart beats. Plus, as an added bonus, there's a line on the bottom of the page in the middle of the beating that looked like probably an inch long. And I said, of course, what is that? Because that kind of caught hello my attention. And he said, that is a point in which about three seconds that you did not have a heartbeat. Your heart didn't beat during that three seconds there. I said, okay, you've got my attention. <laughs> what do you want to do? He said, well, in our last meeting, I had mentioned pacemaker to you. I said, yeah, yeah. I didn't come in here to talk about that. But like I knew what I was talking about, you know? Right. Better than the 70-something-year-old dark that was standing in front of me. And uh, he said, yeah, I think we should do the pacemaker. And I looked at that dash on the page at blank spot. That's black and white. It was it was right there in front of me. And I said, hard to argue with that. Right. It is very difficult. And I said, okay, when do you want to do this? He said, oh, we can wait. How about, this was on a Monday when I'm sitting there in the office. And, and he said, we can do it Wednesday. I said, well. <laughs> I said, I can knock off the rest of the day and we can do it right now. How do you think about that? And he, he said, uh, no, no. He said, don't worry. He said, you're good. He said, but we will do it Wednesday. I said, okay. That's how the pacemaker done. 
Well, good for you because, you know, I work in the electrophysiology lab frequently. I'm right. an anesthetist. Okay. I give anesthesia. And I do a lot of work in EP lab. So doing it Wednesday when you saw him Monday, that was pretty much let's do it right now as soon as we can. Yeah, I understood his sense of urgency on the deal. Mine was more than that, but his was more reasonable. I mean, you didn't want to see any more of those spaces it. where there's no beats, did so, you? Yeah, Wednesday's fine. So we did it. We did it. Good. Excellent. So you've had the same pacemaker for 10 years now. We'd also done a stress test before that, sometime before that. And I thought that was quite evil. The whole idea of that stress test was to remove the bones of the legs and become rubber, which is kind of what happened. <laughs> gotcha. Because historically, I and a lot of the other heart patients I've talked to have had very low heart rates. And I, I don't know why my heart rate since I remember as a kid was 48 to 50. And the cardiologist was afraid that when it was having these arrhythmias, the heart rate was getting down lower than that at night. Sure. In a resting state. And that's what really cautioned him. And they said, we need to do this pacemaker because right. it's not getting any better. It's not going to. Sure. Absolutely. Most people, their heart rate goes down at night. When your heart rate starts out low and it goes really low at night, sometimes when you have long pauses between beats, little arrhythmias can pop up in between. So they want to make sure things move along at a reasonable pace. Right. That makes good sense. And so I know I have a pacemaker because I know it's there. Right. Yeah. But day to day, no. I know it's there, but it's I don't know it's there because of health issues, really. Well, I know it's good. It's, it's pretty not. good. It's pretty good that you had it for 10 years and there have been no phone calls about the end of the battery life and that kind of thing about replacing the generator because that'll happen eventually. That is what happened last year. Okay. We played that check-in game pretty frequently there at the end because right. we were doing every six month checks mm -hmm. on it at the eight or nine year mark. And then we got to the end and, and finally we did. We did it almost 10 years to the month, I think. We did. <laughs> yeah. My brother had a device. He had an in implantable defibrillator and he wasn't really aware. He probably didn't listen very carefully when they were telling him things to watch out for, for the end of battery life. And so he told me a story that he and his wife were sitting at home and he heard this tiny little beeping noise and he couldn't figure out where in the house it was coming from. He went all over the house <laughs> and it sounded the same everywhere. Then his wife leaned close to his chest and said, that's coming from you. Yeah. And it was a tiny little alarm saying, go see your doctor. Excellent. Okay. Well, I'm glad you have a new one. So, hey, yeah, so, so you basically, you had your 100,000 mile checkup and you're ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> new parts, new shoes. We're good. Home Tonight Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Carl, before the break, we were talking about your medical history. Mm -hmm. Now let's focus on your family. Carl, in the opening, we learned that you have three children and that none of them have a heart condition. Can you tell us if your wife was considered a high-risk pregnancy because of the possibility? Well, no. Of course, we knew the history, but for all three, they were normal pregnancies. We had no issues. She had no abnormal issues. We knew that when first was born, my son is the oldest. I've got two girls after young, and we sure checked him out. 
at the hospital before we left. We knew that the pediatrician knew the score and there was no anything that was discovered that was out of the ordinary with any of the three children. It was just Good. like I was uh, one of five, fourth of five. I was the one right. that was, you're the one. And none of your siblings had any problems either. There are a couple of them were a bit ugly, but they're working on that, you know. That's go <laughs> away. <laughs> well, I hope they listen to this no, podcast. So. <laughs> so when your three children were in utero, did they consider doing a level two ultrasound to see if there were any problems? No. Nah. Just went ahead and delivered normally. Good. Good. Okay. So were you concerned that any of them would have a heart condition? Did you think about it or was that just oh, kind of in the back of your mind? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. both knew the history and not knowing why I was the thing, you're the one, not knowing why, right. will she'll sure get your attention when you're having your own sure. children. So yeah, we did what we could. We checked him out, checked her out, each of the girls afterwards but there was no there was no anything that was found yeah well i see what you're saying since yours kind of came out of the blue mm -hmm. there's no way to be sure if your kids would or wouldn't and really anybody this kind of thing could happen to them and i have friends who have said they were made extra aware of the possibility of problems with their child even though they're not related to me because yeah. my child had a problem so they were kind of on alert they were looking for the signs just in case yeah i understand i've heard that discussion also with Facebook group that I've been in for years and years of TAPVR parents. And the discussion goes on about the heredity part of TAPVR and CHDs and whether they are or not. All I can tell the folks that ask me is that we did not experience any of that. The children or my siblings, in my case, we had no issues. I was just spanked the one. Now, we know from the opening that you have five grandchildren and that all of them are heart healthy. Was there ever a concern any of them would be born with a heart condition? Not a concern, but an awareness. This is what Pop had. He had an issue when he was born, a heart issue. So the kids, of which all three of mine now have children, but they did, in fact, check them out. Of the five, I've got my seven-year-old grandson had a little bit of an issue with his, it was just the, the hole in the heart that didn't mend as quickly, I guess, or that close yeah. up as quickly. Right. She went back a couple of times for that, but nothing ever came of it. Hmm. He showed no signs of anything, much less anything close to what I had with the bluing of the extremities and the fingertips yeah. and things that go on. Sometimes when an infant has an innocent murmur, there's no obvious, as you said, no yeah. symptoms, no defect you can tell, sometimes heal on its own as the child grows. That's a good thing. Did any of the grandchildren have any special testing done on them in utero or as infants? Were they also checked out like your kids were after birth? They were just checked after birth. There was no utero checking that went on other than the normal processes. Right. No special ultrasounds or anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. But what they can do with an ultrasound these days, holy smoke. My youngest grandchild is three, three months old today. And whew, boy, the clarity of these ultrasounds is crazy. What they it can is detect and see nowadays is amazing. Yeah. Now, it's not uncommon for children to be born with innocent murmurs, which we were talking about for your one grandson. My granddaughter was born with a heart murmur, but it went away before she turned one year of age. And you said that one of your grandchildren had an innocent murmur that cleared up on its own. Have any of your grandchildren had any other health problems? No, at all. Oh, you've been blessed. Yeah, we have been. I hope that continues, but no, they have not had any issues. And the Excellent. I guess I misstated is four months old today. Time flies. It's amazing how fast they grow. It flies. So are any of your grandchildren living close to you? We've got four of them or within eh, 30, 35 minutes. That's nice. One is actually in Lafayette. The youngest, the, the new one, the brand new one is in Lafayette, which we are over just across the Texas, Louisiana line. Right. Near Beaumont. And so they're two hours away. It's not bad. 
Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect or CHD community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. We've talked about your health history and your family's health history. Let's talk about you and some experiences you've had in the heart world. I know from your intake form that you made an effort to find the very first patient Dr. Cooley operated on with TAPVR. Can you share that experience with us? Boy, that's a story. Mike has become, of course, a good friend of mine. He was the first survivor of this defect that Dr. Cooley had faced six months before my surgery was his. And our parents kept up with each other for a number of years, actually, afterwards, because Mike was originally from Lake Charles. That's not far from where I grew up. I grew up in a little town called Fort Arthur. So the Texas state line separated the two cities. And Mike and I lost touch. The parents lost touch after a number of years. And, and we just, we just did. Life went on and Mike wound up of all towns in Lafayette. So he lives in the same town my daughter does now. And then we got to be older, and this whole thing was my brothers and my mom banging on me about the, you should see a cardiologist. And I thought, you know, during all that, I've wondered to myself, I wonder how Mike's doing. I remember Mike from being as a little toddler, and our parents talked about them a lot because of the uniqueness of the whole thing. I got to wondering about Mike, and his name is very, very, very common. And I went to uh, Google and looked for his name. I thought there's a million of them out there. Yeah. And there were, and the very first hit that I got that I looked at on Google for his name was, was a death notice. And I looked at the numbers. I did the quick math in my head thinking, okay, this is a little bit too close to home. I called mom, who was, mom passed away in 15, so this was back in 08, we're doing all this. I said, mom, Mike's mom had a unique name. She said, yeah, she did. And she told me her name. And I said, okay, that's what I'll do. Then I'll go Google her name. We'll narrow the field. <laughs> so I did, and it did. And the hit that I got on Google for her name was, in fact, a death notice. And it was... It was her because she had, she passed away. But I thought, well, how can you find that person? I went to like Charles Funeral Homes and I said, okay, let's call a funeral home and see who did the service. Because in a service, in an obit, they'll list the survivors, you know, this person of New Orleans or of Texas, you know, whatever the city, at least I can narrow it down that way. I found uh, some funeral homes in Louisiana in Lake Charles. And there were probably six, I think, as I recall. Pick up the phone one Monday morning, and I'm going to call the very first one. I just picked one at the stack. And I called, and I asked the lady who answered the phone. I said, first thing I thought of was I'm trying to convince somebody that I'm not crazy, that I'm looking for somebody from 50 years ago. <laughs> and really, you're going to, how do we find this person? And I said, Carl Wolford, I had heart surgery on the baby, and the first baby to survive this was from like Charles. His mother was this person here. And she said, yes. She said, yes. So I asked the lady on the phone, she's very nice. And I asked the lady on the phone, I said, so who it was and who I'm looking for. And she said, yes. She said, that is Mr. Johnson's brother. 
I thought to myself, I haven't told you nearly enough about who I'm looking for. I said, Mr. Johnson's brother, he had a heart defect and he was a heart surgery and, and he's, he's this old and he's, well, I'm not sure. That's Mr. Johnson's brother. I said, who's Mr. Johnson? She said, he owns the funeral home you just called. <laughs> I said, you're kidding me. What a coincidence. Through this whole finding him and reconnecting with Dr. Cooley was a, an amazing amount of divine intervention. I'm completely convinced. But that was one of them. But I found Mike, which I thought would be a several weeks or months process, took place in about 10 minutes. Excellent. And she said, give me your cell number. I will forward sure. this on to him and we'll do that. And I said, perfect. So 15 minutes later, I'm on the phone with Mike after 45 years. We talked for the longest time about things that have been going for the last 45 years. So we keep in contact now quite a bit. Big interest in each other's health. You had said that in your family that you stood out. You were the one person with a heart defect. None of your siblings, none of your descendants, that sort of thing. So did you feel kind of like reaching out to Mike was like reaching out to a brother that you had lost track of? Because Absolutely. Because he shared things with you that nobody else could. Absolutely. We have a bond that is extremely unique. We both know that. Well, it's an unfortunate bond, but it's a fortunate outcome. Right. That we share. Yeah. And that's, that is the thing that think people nowadays, especially in today's technology age, where we have access to so much so easily, for the most part, we're able to connect. It is amazing. And I know a lot of people have found people that they had lost track of before. Like you said, you had a unique bond. And 40 years earlier, you would not have made that connection again. You wouldn't have had the ability to access like that. We would not have. Absolutely fascinating. He goes to a doctor checkup, for example, a cardiologist checkup. I think we both do annuals now, once a year. And we let each other know, this is what happened. This is the medication I'm on now. Right. Mike has gone through a couple of actual ablations. I haven't done that. The cardiologist brought it up to me, oh, what, eight years ago, 10 mm -hmm. years ago. But we didn't have not had the need to do that yet. We it's one of the steps down. you can progress to. Yeah. So it's one of the possible pathways therapeutically. So Right. It's yeah. a little more, I guess, invasive, I suppose. Yep. But we haven't had the need for it yet. They did get brought up. Mike did that. Mike did that at 45 or so. So if you ever have to do it, he can give you the lowdown. Yeah, exactly. Nice. We keep nice. each other updated on our pacemakers. And I think he's on number two right now, but I think he's free <laughs> medication right now. So I don't know. Yeah. 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 We'll see. Just remember, it's not a competition. You're not no. trying to have more procedures oh, than no. him. <laughs> no, I know. We keep in contact, especially with my youngest being there. This right. Year. So have you seen him face to face? Oh, yeah. Excellent. Good. He and I hooked up with Dr. Cooley in 08 for a reunion of sorts after 50 years. And Mike and I's point was to go back to Cooley, sit down with him for 10 minutes. This guy is a world-renowned cardiologist, and we wanted to show Dr. Cooley, that the work that you did back in 58 worked. It worked pretty good. That is absolutely And great. here we are. We sat in that office with Dr. Cooley thinking he was going to carve out 10 minutes. We sat there for probably an hour. With him. He wouldn't let Wonderful. us go. He just got the Wonderful. biggest kick out of that. That's cool. Yeah. Now, when I listened to the first episode of Heart to Heart with Anna, where you talked to Anna about your history, I heard you talk about someone named Julie. How important has it been for you to meet other people with your heart condition? That's one of the things that I think is huge to be able to offer people. I've always said, if I ever retire, there are a few things that I'd like to do instead of going to the office every day. One of them is cool, is, right. is doing more of that on the road. And then the other is course, the green kids and there is the heart world and the heart world would be meeting more people, letting more people know people that have babies that are younger in life that don't even know that there's, there's a 65 year old guy, two of them walking around the earth 
with the same thing that your baby has. Right. Same thing. And they are blown away by that. And so in my effort to do that, to begin that years ago on a limited basis, I met Julie. Julie is a lady, was the probably the person closest to my age. And I never met anybody other than Mike with TAPVR. And she was the first one. And she got the biggest kick out of that little meeting. It's just so gratifying, I guess, to be able to show people life can go on. We don't bat a thousand. We, unfortunately, we lose some along the way. And that's unfortunate. It really is. But we don't bat a thousand, but we do do pretty well. We do better nowadays, of course, than we used to. And Julie's one of them in Arkansas. It was so neat to be able to share stories, and commonalities with somebody that's that's been in your shoes. That yeah, yeah. y'all have this unique bond, and it's really, Absolutely. really neat to be able to do. And it's it's gratifying. I'm sure, and hopeful and encouraging to people that are younger. I've heard people say, "Well, my baby, I don't know how long is this a normal life, you know, or, or is it a normal lifespan? Is it limited to your activities and?" They don't know. They don't know. And a lot of times it is normal and it can go on quite normally. I mean, totally normal. And they, they just need to know that. Absolutely. Speaking as a father of a heart child myself, that's one of the hardest things is that you're so used to seeing your other children and other people's children having a normal life, sleeping in their cribs at home, that sort of thing. And to see your child in the ICU with tubes and wires, it's terrifying. And you wonder if it's ever going to go back to normal. So having the assurance from someone who's been down the path that it will become normal again after a while is very, very important. Carl, it's been a delight having you on the show. It's been a delight talking with you again after so long. Thank you for coming on the program today. Well, thanks for having me, Frank. It's been a delight and I really, really tip my hat to what y'all are doing for the heart community. We really appreciate it. Well, this is why we do it because we get to meet people like you and talk with you and share important things. We're glad to have you. Very good. I appreciate it. Well, that concludes this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thanks for listening today. Please tune in tomorrow to hear another Medical Monday episode for Heart Month 2023. Have a great day. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have become inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart community. Heart to Heart with Anna with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard at any time wherever you get your podcasts. A new episode is released every Tuesday from noon Eastern time.